Hello and welcome to The Conversation Weekly. I'm Dan Marino in San Francisco. And I'm Gemma Ware in London. And this week we're talking food and how some countries are trying to persuade their citizens to change what they eat. So Dan, I have this question that I ask people quite often. So I want to ask it to you. If you had to choose between eating potato or onion for the rest of your life, you could only choose one of them, which one would you go for? I'd go with potatoes because, you know, I can put some scallions, maybe a green onion in there, but a potato's a potato. A lot lot of good use you could make with a potato. But I also think it's a bit of a weird comparison, right? Like potato is like a staple food where onion is really for flavor and for, you know, color as well. You're right. So if we're talking staples, maybe a better question would be to say, if you had to choose to only eat potatoes or rice with your meal from now on, what would you do? Oh, uh, you're asking the wrong guy here because I love rice. But why are you making me choose, Gemma? I don't want to have to choose. Yeah, you're right. You're right. But actually, this choice, this choice of whether to eat potatoes or rice is something that the Chinese government is really interested in because it wants more of its citizens to start thinking about that question. It's hoping to get more people to switch to eating potatoes as a staple food rather than rice. So China switching from rice to potatoes, that sounds like a massive undertake. I mean, first, there's the cultural aspect of things. I just associate East Asia with rice. But then also, like China's what, one point something billion people to switch the staple food of a country that large. That's going to be a big lift. So why? Well, that is a great question. And it's something I've been looking into for this episode. Why would a country like China want to change its national diet? And there are actually multiple reasons for this. One of them might be climate change, which is putting increasing pressures on the way food around the world is produced. But actually, simply, it's about making sure everyone gets enough calories and nutrients. So let's start with China and its efforts to shift people to eating more potatoes. I called up a researcher who's been looking into what they've been doing. My name is Xiaobo Xuanro Miko. I am an associate professor at the Department of Environmental Health Sciences, University at Albany State University of New York. Xiaobo studies the environmental impact of different types of food production systems. I'm always interested in, you know, what people eat. I love cooking. And uh, (laughs) so I'm always interested in, you know, (laughs) uh, what's the dietary choices of other folks, my fellows, and also, you know, how our choices are going to impact our environment. So you say you love cooking. And one of the things we're going to talk to you about today is the potato. So do you eat a lot of potatoes? Tell me. Oh, my family does, actually. My mom is a potato lover, so <laughs> I grew up with uh, lots of potato dishes. What kind of dishes? Stir-fried potato and potato noodles and even potato dumplings. Oh, so yummy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I know that some parts of China, people eat more potatoes than others. So is this from the north of China? Is that right? Yeah, I grew up in the northern part of China. So the potatoes are kind of part of the cuisine. Right, yeah. Traditionally, potato is used as a vegetable dish rather than a staple food in China. So, you know, there are a variety of ways for cooking potatoes, from steamed to fried to baked these days, right? And also with the influence of Western culture, and these days we also have potato fries, which may Uh not be a healthy choice, but it's available. China is actually the world's largest potato planting country, and it produces about 20% of the world's potato output. But while fresh potatoes are a traditional part of China's national diet, when it comes to their use as a staple, they've been dwarfed by rice, wheat and maize or corn. Potato consumption amount per capita varies greatly from country to country. And uh, currently, actually, China's consumption per capita is lower than the global average. But the Chinese government wants to change this. And in 2015, it decided to start promoting potatoes as a staple food. I think the original write-up of the policy is that potato would never fight with the rice, wheat and the corn for resources. So essentially, that was the saying that the hope is that the potato wouldn't replace those existing staple foods. And instead, the potato would diversify the choices of staple foods. Concerns over food security are one of the main reasons behind China's decision to start pushing people to eat more potatoes. The arable land in China is limited. 
but because of the、um, population flux and the economic growth, the demand of food is increasing. So the question is, where are we going to grow, you know, extra food with limited land? But potato is more versatile, and it can be grown in marginal land, which not initially used or not suitable as arable land. So that potato comes in to fill in this gap. The scarcity of water is also a big part of the picture. Agricultural production is one of the major water user. So if we compare across the water use of different possible staple foods, and a potato comes out, you know, as one of the relatively efficient water user. So that can essentially lessen the water stress issues in China. As well as needing less water than other cereals, growing potatoes also requires less nitrogen fertilizer, says Jabo, which makes them a less energy-intensive crop. Nutritionally, they're also rich in vitamin C, several types of vitamin B, potassium, and antioxidants. So, thinking of the overall picture, you know, the more food, the less land, and also the need to reduce water use and energy use. So it seems like a potato is a pretty good choice. Farmers get a subsidy to grow potatoes. It's roughly a hundred yuan, or around fourteen US dollars per mu, which is around six hundred and seventy square meters. But despite this, there are still some challenges for farmers. Potatoes are prone to disease, and China typically hasn't invested in disease-resistant seed varieties of potato. Less than half of China's potato crops are planted using seeds that are virus-free. And this means that losses from potato crops are often higher than other staples, which can put farmers off. China also has a long way to go in terms of its processing capacity for potatoes, because it's traditionally focused on them just as a vegetable. This means it needs more investment in processing for potato starch that could be used in, say, noodle dishes or as flour for dumplings on a mass scale. So right now, you know, then the question comes up: Is that do we have technology to do that? And if we do, then do we have enough business to drive it to a certain capacity? And also, would that product would be cheap enough to be attractive for consumers? And also, how would that influence the flavors of the the food eventually? Mm. So I don't think there are answers for those questions at this point.、Mm, okay. But the good news is that the research funds seems like right now are available. So Jabo told me that the Chinese government has allocated ten billion dollars for research on the best way to store and process potatoes. In terms of the impact on food security, do you know yet if it's actually having an impact? This shift towards potatoes. Do we have any evidence yet of that? The policy initially was set out in 2015, and I don't think. They have reached the production goal yet at this point. I think though it's a great you know strategic planning goal, but you know perhaps due to COVID nineteen and also various barriers, the goal haven't been reached yet. So it's hard to say you know what is the actual impact of this policy or food security up to this point. But also, I think we have to look beyond right now, and to say, you know, in future, maybe next ten, twenty years, and if this occurs, and how the food security will be influenced.、Hmm. Uh, I think if the policy is successful, and China's food security issue will be solved partially, and essentially the food security issue would be increased, would be enhanced. This type of massive policy change to just entirely switch a country from one staple, rice, to potatoes, really feels like something only a place like China could do. A because it's a top-down declaration of this is now how the world is, but B just to be able to throw so many billions of dollars at something like this is a unique situation. Yeah, China is unique perhaps in the way it's approaching this problem, but it's really not the only country that's facing food insecurity. So just actually here today in the UK, the National Farmers Union warned that the country was walking into a food supply crisis thanks to like the high cost of fuel, fertilizer, and and feed for animals. We've got food security as one reason to be doing this. There's cost of living, which seems like in the UK it's a big deal. Certainly in the US, food prices have gone up a lot. But a lot of times when I'm thinking about food and talking about food with my friends and colleagues. 
A big issue is climate change. So how does that factor into national diets and what countries are thinking about food? Yes, climate change and environmental pressures are a really big part of the picture here. And according to many researchers, that is why countries are going to need to follow China's lead and shift their own national diets. At the moment, the food system really is under the highest stress it's seen in a very long time, perhaps ever. This is Paul Berens. He's an associate professor in environmental change at Leiden University in the Netherlands. I work in an area called industrial ecology, which means that we look at both the ways in which we consume products and the ways in which we produce them and how they meet our needs. Are there any better ways of doing things? Food systems, you know, they've always seen disruptions from conflict, disease, extreme weather events. These we've always had to cope with in the agricultural systems. But what we're seeing now is that climate change is driving harsher and more extreme weather. And that's altering the pattern of the seasons. It's changing the overall temperatures for plants and farmers. As a result, agricultural yields around the world have seen a huge decline. So the farming productivity is about sort of 21% lower than it could have been without that climate change. There's research that suggests that climate change has wiped out about seven years of agricultural growth in yields. And so that's putting pressure on systems that are already seeing impacts from, say, conflict in terms of Russia-Ukraine war and also disease in terms of COVID-19 and pandemics like that. So it really makes everything else harder to cope with. This means that many countries have had to rely on a few so-called global bread baskets to feed their populations. We have quite a concentrated global food system. So there's a number of regions in the world which produce quite a lot of our grains. And these are commonly called bread baskets. And so we have these bread baskets and two of them are Russia and Ukraine. So that's been a really significant amount of major grains around the world that's been taken off the market. And in response to that, we've seen really big price increases due to those grains missing from the market. So You know, it's just this constant grind, this constant pressure that the food systems are facing on top of the things that we're already struggling to deal with. Because of this combination of factors, climate change, the COVID-19 pandemic, the over-reliance on a few bread baskets and the ripple effects of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, Paul says that the world is facing an unprecedented food crisis. Currently, the UN's Food and Agricultural Organization, which gathers together all the data on this, their food price index is at the highest it's ever been. It's higher than the food crisis in 2007-2008. Uh, and are these pressures affecting populations around the world differently, depending on where they are geographically? There are big issues already around the world in regions like Somalia, which is on the verge of famine, and sub-Saharan Africa is already a region that has seen ongoing droughts for many years now. These are climate-driven droughts. The attribution studies that look at the impact climate has on those droughts has found the signal there. Attribution studies are a type of research that looks at the link between severe weather events such as droughts or floods and climate change. But even in middle income nations, we're starting to see more food riots, places like Indonesia, uh, Ecuador, Peru. And this is what we see every time the food price index gets up quite high. Even in high income nations, you're starting to see issues with the most unequal of those high income nations. So in areas like the UK, in the US, where we've got quite unequal societies, you're starting to see more and more people fall into food insecurity. And globally, the FAO, the Food and Agricultural Organization, thinks that food insecurity has been rising. Some countries have been trying to mitigate the impacts, but Paul thinks their policy responses have been largely short-sighted. We did see quite a lot of countries bring in export restrictions. So they said, look, when we're producing this food, we're not going to let it be exported overseas. And then we'll be able to subsidise or bring down the costs for people locally, for people domestically. But I don't see an awful lot of governments considering the real fundamental system transitions that are needed uh, to really secure food systems and to make them more resilient to future sort of climatic change. It's sort of the same as the Build Back Better and the Green New Deal and all of the things that came out of that COVID-19 period where it was, let's do this in a green way, let's build back in a green way, let's build back in a sustainable way. And of course, a lot of the time, that falls by the wayside and people then rush to maintain the same systems that we're currently in. In Europe, for example, the response to the crisis has effectively propped up the supply of feed for animals. In many countries around Europe, about 70% of all land is used for animal agriculture, either for growing the crops to feed the animals or for the pastures for the animals. And the EU 
subsidies often support more animal agriculture than you might think. So 60% of the grain that's coming in, for example, from Ukraine is going to animal products, which is then being exported as high value animal products with huge environmental impacts. To improve food security and limit the impacts of climate change, Paul argues that radical changes are needed to national diets. But he says the change needs to happen first in high income countries, where the overconsumption of meat is driving much of the crisis. I really think it's a little bit similar to energy transitions. You know, the high income nations which have the most capacity for this change should be leading in this change. They're also the ones that are driving a lot of the emissions. So, you know, animal derived products make up about 70% of the food system emissions in high income nations. And in, you know, low middle income nations, it's only 22%. And given that you know, animal derived products drive a lot of these emissions, it's really incumbent upon us to change. I mean, we do have the alternatives. And the interesting thing about dietary change in general is the system and the individual are quite tightly connected. In lower income countries, big dietary changes are much less feasible. In general, if you're a pastoralist or a smallholder in a low or middle income nation, maybe not in the urban regions, you may not have access to these uh, plant-based proteins or you may not have access to other micronutrients in your diet. And so your cattle are your lifeline in that way. So yeah, it's not for everywhere. But I mean, in high income nations, especially, there's no excuse. We over consume protein anyway, even if we didn't have the uh, proteins available to us, but we maybe twice the amount of protein that we need every day anyway. So, Gemma, it's been really interesting listening to your discussions with Paul and Xiaobo because it almost seems like there's a couple different reasons to think about changing national diet. Of course, we've got on the smallest scale, the individual, got to be healthy. And then you zoom out a little bit and you've got this kind of national scale that is how to make sure my country is well fed as the climate changes. And then you've got this final kind of big picture, almost preventative scale, which is how can I grow food, achieve those other things while also preventing the worst of climate change? Yeah, it's all connected when you put it like that. I guess for me, though, talking to them both, I was really thinking about what it actually meant for me and what I can put on my plate every day in a perhaps a little bit of a selfish way. No, but you're right. That's an excellent point. Like if we're going to try and do all these things, is there a single diet that works? So Gemma, is there? Well, that's actually exactly what a researcher called Marco Springman and a team of scientists that he worked with tried to figure out. So the Eat Lancet Commission was this big uh, science-based commission with commissioners from all kinds of different fields. And we had four objectives to, to accomplish. I mean, the overarching idea was we wanted to describe a food system that can feed a growing population healthily and within environmental limits. Marco is a professor of climate change, food systems and health at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And he's also a senior researcher on environment and health at the University of Oxford in the UK. In 2019, he was part of a team of international scientists who looked at the food people consume around the world as part of their daily diets. You record what people eat, you follow that up for a couple of decades, basically, until they die from different diseases. Um, and if you have enough numbers and enough people, then you can identify what was the impact of one group of people just differing in one aspect of their diet. So let's say one group uh, consumed one more serving of red or processed meat than the other group. And otherwise, they were fairly similar in lifestyle, smoking, weight, exercise, other foods and so on then you can statistically say, okay, that one more consumption of red and processed meat resulted in an increased risk of dying from certain diet-related diseases like coronary heart disease, stroke, uh, type 2 diabetes, or, or different cancers. They found a growing trend towards what he calls the westernization of diets. We see that as income increases, uh, usually diets shift towards what is perceived as higher valued foods. So more meat, more dairy, more oils, um, also more fruits and vegetables. So those are also increased, but it's basically more of anything. But this rise in consumption hasn't been equal across all food groups. In high income countries, we easily consume six to eight times uh, too much red meat, for example. And, and usually only half or 30% less of the fruits and vegetables. We should be consuming way too much dairy, two to three times, but usually too much sugar, also two to three times uh, of what is considered to be okay. So that, that's what I mean with a high income diet. So uh, lots of animal source foods and sugar and too few fruits and vegetables and other plant-based foods. 
And this overconsumption is taking the world very close to what Marco calls its planetary boundaries, the absolute environmental limits for natural resource use and emissions that need to be respected in order to avoid potentially irreversible climate change. If we don't change course when it comes to our food system, we might exceed all planetary boundaries that are related to the food system. So the Eat Lancet team decided to come up with a diet that would consider not just health, but also our planetary boundaries. What they came up with is what you might call a flexitarian diet. It's mainly plant-based and recommends only eating meat and dairy from time to time. You shouldn't have more than one serving of red meat per week, not more than two servings of poultry per week, not more than two servings of fish per week. And if you have dairy, not more than one serving per day. Now, if you count it, that makes five days. So that means on two days, you should be either vegetarian or vegan. And in general, I mentioned lots of things that you shouldn't do, So, in general, but there are many things you also should do. So the, your plate should look fairly green and colorful. So at least five servings of fruits and vegetables per day, one to two servings of legumes uh, per day, meaning beans, lentils and anything like that one to two servings of nuts per day and whole grains instead of refined grains and oils that are high in unsaturated fatty acids. So like olive oil? For example, or rapeseed oil, these kinds of things. Um, and not much sugar, so uh, if possible, less than about 30 grams. Okay. And do you follow this diet? Yeah, I, I actually do. <laughs> How is it going? Yeah, very well. Um, I mean, the thing is, this diet now has this sort of name, Eat Lancet Diet or Eat Lancet Recommendations, but um, the health literature for decades has recommended something like this, right? So this didn't fall from the sky. So, uh, for example, classical Mediterranean diet is very similar to that. Those uh, Okinawa diets, for example, that are a bit more fish-based, but otherwise they're also very similar there are diets uh, that the Adventists in California uh, follow. They are, because of their religion, uh, vegetarian or vegan. Um, they are very much in line with those general recommendations as well. Um, and in all those regions, people tend to be very old, actually. I mean, they're also physically active and have supporting communities. But it is thought that also those diets make a difference there. Dan, so after talking with Marco, obviously start thinking about my own diet. And while I have actually been trying to eat a bit more vegetarian recently, I'm still far off this diet. I'm still eating way too much red meat, I, I reckon. I think I was doing okay, but as I was thinking about this, like pretty good on the meat ratios, but probably a little less on the veggies. And I drink a lot of oat milk. I'm one of those people. So maybe okay on the dairy. But this Eat Lancet diet, Gemma, it's got to be kind of expensive, right? Fresh veggies, nice nuts. These things are not cheap. There's a reason people default to chips and cheap meat and fast food because it's cheap. That's actually one of the the big criticisms of the Eat Lancet diet, that it requires people to eat larger quantities of vegetables, fruits and nuts to satisfy their daily nutritional requirements. But even in high income countries, that can sometimes not be very affordable to those on lower incomes. It got me wondering, sure, you and I were doing OK. Individuals can make their own decisions, but... Are any countries making policy changes to try and get onto something close to this this kind of diet or not? That's what I wanted to know from Marco. Have any countries actually implemented this diet, which is also called the planetary health diet, on a national scale? Well, um, implemented is always a different thing than uh, in, envisaged, for example. So lots of dietary guidelines um, around the world are at the moment in the process of being reformulated. So at the moment, I'm in Spain, and they had a large, uh, long process of actually updating their national dietary guidelines. And the ones there, uh, that they came up with um, are maybe unsurprisingly so fairly similar to the Eat Lancet recommendations. And you have other examples, the Canadian dietary guidelines or the Brazilian ones, when they show you a picture of how they think a plate should look like, even though sometimes the description is not sort of exactly the same, but the pictures look fairly similar. So they all stress the importance of a diverse composition of plant-based foods and animal source foods and, and processed foods in, in moderation. Marco says it's all well and good for government agencies to suggest national level guidelines. But whether or not consumers follow them has a lot to do with what kind of food is made available in what he calls the food environment. We describe the food system that we see as citizens as the food environment. 
And that really much determines what we eat or what we choose to eat. So if you think about what are your dietary choices on a day, maybe sort of breakfast very often is what your colleagues eat, what is offered, for example, at your school place or in, uh, at your workplace in canteens, what is offered at restaurants, what is offered in supermarkets. So the food environment around you gives you a very strong incentive to choose one thing over another. And you experience that if you are in a different country, uh, maybe for holiday or work reasons or so, suddenly uh, there are different foods and people de eat different things and you should surely to eat then different things. So um, we tend to think that it really needs changes in that food environment to incentivize and enable really citizens to choose a healthier and more sustainable diet. But he says food environments depend a lot on targeted government action and policies. It's important to recognize that the policy framework is really the one that determines very many of those things. At the moment, the uh, uh, food industry and the food environment are so poorly regulated because very often politicians think, oh, we must not prescribe what citizens eat, not recognizing that if they don't put safety measures basically in, in place, it is really up to the food industry to push anything onto the consumer. And very rarely has the food industry health and environmental sustainability in mind when they produce foods and market those foods. But some governments can face resistance from business lobbies when they try to shift behavior. Unfortunately, because dietary guidelines are also political documents, uh, when it comes to the political adoption stage, they are sometimes watered down. We have seen that uh, in the case of the US recommendations. They contain lot, lots more animal source foods, so you can <laughs> make your conclusions about why, uh, why, why that is. If we want to tackle food security and continue living on our planet for future generations to come, Marco told me governments must commit to implementing change. It's not an option to stay with the system that we have because we are really headed for disaster if, if we do that. So something has to give and uh, there is tremendous opportunity to change the food system. Uh, it has health benefits, it has environmental benefits, it could be cheaper for households or uh, it has financial benefits. But there are obviously winners and losers always in society, especially if a current system has to change and uh, farmers will have to adopt. That doesn't need to go to their detriment, but it needs to be an active process uh, that is also co-led by them uh, to make sure that there is a feasible path of transforming the food system. Well, this sounds like a policy question, Gemma, right? If you're going to need to swap out meat for veggies and a lot of veggies, like that sounds like a food system change. And it's got me wondering, China's decision to switch from rice to potatoes kind of almost seems like more of a halfway measure, really, than it is a full-scale switch to something that would be similar to this planetary health diet, right? Because they're not swapping meat for veggies. They're just swapping one starchy staple for another. That point, Dan, that point about what the impact is of a policy like China's is really interesting. And I actually asked Xiao Bo about it. She said that in the case of a country as big as China, any dietary shift, like the ones from rice, wheat to potatoes, does actually have significant impact. And she's actually recently published a study that looks at the environmental impacts of different types of staple foods in China. So we focus our study in China. Um, so we looked at chemical needs, water needs, and also the equipment needs for growing these staple foods. We also calculated the uh, associated greenhouse gas emissions, for instance, from fertilizer application and also from the energy use for operating the tractors. Their study also looked at consumption trends over the past 40 years, from 1980 to 2020. So we found a little bit the different trends between the rural population and urban population. Um, so we also found that overall, it seems like the staple consumption decreased a little bit in the history, regardless it's rice or wheat or potato. Which makes sense. So uh, that that's essentially the saying that, you know, the dietary choices actually have is gradually changed in the history. When they started analysing the greenhouse gas emissions of various staples, they found that the potato came out way ahead. Essentially, we found that the greenhouse gas emission of a potato is less than um, rice and also wheat flour. For instance, the greenhouse gas intensity for producing potato 
roughly is、uh, around 0.5 to 0.7 kilogram carbon dioxide per kilogram potato. And for the wheat, so which is in the ballpark with the potato, but、uh, for rice, which almost doubles this greenhouse gas emission intensity. And remember, China has only recently begun pumping research funds into growing higher yielding varieties of potato. So right now, so the China's potato yield is lower than the、uh, global average. So there is a great potential for China to improve the yield. If China is successful in increasing yields, Jiabo says it could decrease the greenhouse gas emissions from potatoes even more. Probably at least the fifteen percent of the greenhouse gas intensity. Projecting this into the future, Jiabo modeled what might happen under different scenarios of how successful China's staple potato policy might be. Basically, the higher percentage of the potato we introduce to the staple food, and a higher greenhouse gas emission reduction we would observe. So we found that you know basically introducing this potato to staple food likely can reduce greenhouse gas emission by nine point four to thirty two point six gigagram carbon dioxide. To put that in some perspective, a typical car emits about four point six metric tons of carbon dioxide per year. So Jabo calculated that this reduction could equate to the annual emission of between two and seven thousand cars, depending on how high yielding the potatoes are. Some people might argue that trying to shift the balance of staple foods, so from say rice, wheat to, to potato, doesn't actually make huge amounts of environmental difference because obviously you've set out. You know that it could be three thousand cars worth of emissions per year or more if 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 the yields were increased. But isn't actually like a a more important way of doing this to try and reduce meat consumption? That's a fabulous question. <laughs> no doubt, you know, red meat has the highest greenhouse gas intensity, and、uh, reducing the red meat consumption certainly would greatly reduce. Carbon emissions, and also I, I think I think we need an array of strategies to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. I agree that you know we need to curb our meat production and also meat consumption in order to reduce the carbon emissions. But also I think most folks <laughs> would need to eat the staple food three meals per day. We have to face this question: you know, what are we gonna eat as staple food? So it can be potato, it can be rice, can be wheat, and our research essentially is saying that when we make different choices, and then we gonna result in different environmental impacts. And also, I think besides that, I I do think you know a holistic strategy should be designed in order to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. One certainly is、uh, reduce. The meat consumption, and the other is probably is diversify the staple food choices, and another one can be、um, optimize farming practices to improve the yield and also reduce greenhouse gas emissions off farm and upstream supplying activities as well. And also, it could be reducing food waste as well.、Um, so, if the folks really don't like potato, but we grow a lot, and then it's going to end up in the food waste stream, right?、Um, so, that's certainly the scenario we wanted to avoid. And so, it's a.、Uh, I don't think there is a universal, single universal answer for、uh, reducing the greenhouse gas emissions. Talking to all these researchers, Dan, it left me thinking about: yes, governments can set guidance on certain types of foods. They can have all these big goals. They can promote different crops, like in China, and they can throw money into you know new types of processing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But it it also really just comes down to shifting what people like you and me and everyone else just eats. Right? It's about taste. It's about habits, and that's a really big, big challenge. I hear you, Gemma, and it is a big challenge. I think it's a systemic one. I think it's one governments need to deal with. I generally dislike the framing of issues as it's up to each one of us to fix it because it's not. The governments and systems should be the things that change to make it easier and desirable and cheaper to eat well. So I think this is an interesting discussion that we've had here because it really is a question of systems and policy. And until that changes, we're certainly not going to be eating any differently. That's it for this episode. 
Thank you to all the academics we spoke to for this episode. So, Xiaobo Shu Rumiko, Paul Behrens, and Marco Springman. And also thanks to Zheng Xiaoshun at the China Agriculture University in Beijing, and Yi Yang at Chongqing University, also in China, who we spoke to and who were a big help in putting this episode together. You can find us on Twitter at TC underscore audio, Instagram at theconversation.com, or email us podcast at theconversation.com. And if you like what we do, support the podcast and the conversation, just go to donate.theconversation.com. This episode of The Conversation Weekly was produced by Mend Marawani and Katie Flood. It was written by Mend Marawani and me, and sound design was by Eloise Stevens. Our theme music is by Nita Sell. Stephen Kahn is our global executive editor, Alice Mason runs our social media, and Soraya Nandi does our transcripts. I'm Gemma Ware, the show's executive producer. And I'm Dan Marino. Thanks so much for listening this week.